I have a lot of code examples. Please make sure you can read text of that size. Everyone in the back, are you good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Y'all yeah. have your glasses on. Y'all have eyesight that is better than mine. <laughs> We're good. So I'm Dan. Uh, this talk is going to be about the new mobile web. I, I put the word mobile in there so that I have a better chance of this talk getting accepted. <laughs> but, but there's nothing mobile specific about it. The, the web is the web. It's the same web on your phone as it is on your laptop as it is on desktop. And the thing that I'm going to show you today is a glimpse of, of the future, of where the web can go, the things that it's learning how to do, that make it more competitive, especially on mobile, but also on desktop. So you can email me, dcallahan at mozilla.com. Um, my Twitter handle is Callahan, which is down in the corner. Uh, that'll stay on all the slides. Feel free to tweet at me. Uh, and I have stickers that you can come up and grab at the end of the, the talk. So please don't make me take those home. Uh, I had to declare them at customs. So <laughs> I would like them to stay here. So I, I work for Mozilla. And you might be familiar with Mozilla because we make a, a small open source project called Firefox, which is a free browser that has been really leading the charge in terms of standardization and, and focusing on the web as something that should be interoperable for I think 13, 14 years now that, that Firefox has been around. Um, what Mozilla does, Mozilla, unlike Microsoft or Apple or Google, Mozilla is a nonprofit. And so our interest in building a web browser is we're trying to have a technical state in making sure that the web stays open and stays compatible and stays interoperable. And you can't have an open public resource of the web if a single company can dictate that this is now how you do X and it only works in my browser. This is how you do Y. And you have to you go back to the 90s where you had to choose between the Netscape web or the Internet Explorer web. And, and we don't want that. So Mozilla is Mozilla's working to, to keep the web open, keep the web compatible. And the reason the web is worth fighting for, the thing that makes the web special, is the URL. URLs are universal. URLs, they break barriers, they transcend borders. If you know a URL, you can go to a website. There's no URL store, there's no gatekeeper. If you have access to the web, you have access to the whole web, barring you know, firewalls or proxies or whatever. But, but there's no implicit control over who can publish on the web. This is really important when you start looking at mobile, mobile phones and the rise of app stores. So imagine seven years ago, you live in Nigeria. Nigeria is a top 20 economy in the world. And say you have an iPhone in Nigeria seven years ago. On that iPhone, you'd be able to access the whole web. But you'd still have to wait three more years. It wasn't until 2011 that Nigeria got an app store, that Apple deigned to release an app store in Nigeria. And so, so for whatever reason, this, this move to apps has imposed national borders on, on content again. And it's just, that's, that's not OK. That's worth fighting against. But people, sorry, let, let folks finish getting in. People have, have looked at the web, and they've demanded apps. Even though the web can do so much, even though the web has this, this universality. And why? So if you go back and you look at the original message that, Tim, or that uh, Steve Jobs had when he announced the iPhone, he said, if you want to develop an app for the iPhone, use HTML5. The way you put apps on the iPhone is with the web. But the web wasn't ready. And it took three or four releases of iOS before people said, that Apple said, all right, fine, we relent. We'll let you build actual native apps for the iPhone. And they won. And why did they win? They won for three reasons. Apps tend to be installable. They tend to be a lot more reliable. You know, I, I don't have to worry about when I open up my podcast app on a flight that's going to say, oh, I can't connect because it's, it's an app. It's offline. And apps tend to be more engaging because they can notify you. Even when you're not looking at the app, you can get a message that says, hey, you have a, an email. You have a text. You just finished your Uber ride. Please rate the driver. All of those come just in time without having to keep those specific contexts open. You don't have to keep like the Uber tab open to get that. And so apps offer really compelling advantages for user experience and for polish. And, the, and they won. And the web couldn't do this until this year. 
So starting in 2016, Mozilla and Google, along with other browser manufacturers, have started really focusing on what we can do to address those three deficiencies. How can we make the web installable? How can we make the web more reliable? How can we make the web more engaging? And so I'm going to walk through how each of these things works and how the web solves these problems. Let's start with installation when, when folks get in. Are we, oh, there's still some seats. Um, so first problem. URLs are great, but URLs really want you to have a keyboard, right? Like, it's really easy to type Gmail. It's really hard to, on your phone, tap G-M-A-I-L dot C-O-M. Tiny keyboards, pain. What you want on a phone is you want a big, pretty icon you can tap and just go to whatever you're looking for. So I put the Twitter app on my phone, and I, put, I added to home screen the Twitter website. Can anyone guess which of these is the website and which of these is the app? So, so the one on the left is probably the website. How do you know? Because it looks terrible compared to the one on the right. The app looks a lot nicer. There's this big quality gap. And when I click on the icon on the left, my browser opens up and, and I get Twitter, but I get a version of Twitter that's, you know, the m.twitter.com from years ago. It's, it doesn't look anything like modern Twitter. It, it works, but I also have the URL bar up top. I have the navigation menus down at the bottom. And so this browser interface also takes up a lot of the room that I wish I had for my app. And uh, if I'm not connected to the internet, I get that, which is also not a super great experience. Where if, I, if I'm trying to use Twitter, the app on my phone, it has some tweets that it's already loaded, and it's fine. It still works. I don't get new tweets. But if I try to use Twitter on the web, it just doesn't work. So how do we fix that? I'm going to show you how to fix all that, but let's start with this problem of of just the, the difference in how these things look when you use them. And we're going to solve that by using a technology called app manifests. App manifests are a standard, like everything I'm going to tell you today, everything is a standard. There's varying implementation. Uh, so Chrome fully supports manifest right now. Firefox, we're working on it. All a manifest is is something you can add to the head of your document. You say link rel manifest, point to a JSON document. In that document, you can say things like name, flip cart light, icons, start URL. So no matter where I bookmark this page, whenever I open it from my home screen, I'll go to that root document. I can set the orientation. So if I'm holding my phone sideways and I click on the flip cart, the screen will, will flip so it uses the orientation the developers want. I can set the display to standalone. We'll see what that means in just a second. But look at this. So Flipkart eight months ago took down their mobile website. Three months ago, they relaunched it using the techniques I'm going to talk about, and they've had a lot of success. Because look at this. This is, this is Flipkart in Chrome on Android. And you go to their mobile website, and they have a little thing that says, install this web app to your phone. And you're in the browser. You can see the URL bar up here. Normal browser experience. When you tap that button, it tells you, go into the menu and choose Add to Home Screen. So if I do that, Add to Home Screen, do a little dialog, hit OK. And now when I go back to the, the home page on my phone, I get a flip card icon that looks just like all of the other icons on my, my home screen. It doesn't look different because it's part of the web. And when I click it, this is the, the really nice thing that happens. Because it's set display standalone, notice that there's no URL bar, there's no navigation. This looks indistinguishable from a native app on the phone. It works offline. It's super smooth. I've got it on my phone. It's amazing what they've done. And the only reason you know that this is web and not native is if you open up the developer tools. So if you're, if you're a web agency, if you're building things with Drupal and you have clients come to you and say, well, this is a great mobile site, but I really want something in the App Store. I really want something in the Play Store. Well, maybe, maybe you don't need that. Or I really want offline. Maybe you don't need to build an app to do that. Maybe you can do it just with the web. Any, any questions at this point? Does that make sense? Has anyone actually used Flipkart since they relaunched? The, uh, the mobile, does it work good? Yeah, is it good? Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so before we go on, we're going to talk a little bit about the other two problems. So the installation gets solved by manifests. The other two problems are that web apps typically have not been reliable. They don't work offline. And second, that web apps have tended to not be terribly engaging. Like, they can't notify you. You have to, you have to do all the work to go and check your email in the web app. And to do this, we're going to look at a lot of code. And to look at the code and understand it, we need to, to understand some new syntax in JavaScript. The first are arrow functions. We'll see these a lot. 
It's just a shorthand where you can say arguments, arrow, return value. So these two lines are, are equivalent, but one's just a lot shorter. Does that make sense? Anyone have questions about that? Second are promises. Promises showed up in ES 2015, and they're a new way of handling asynchronous code. So JavaScript is naturally asynchronous. And the way we've dealt with this in the past has been by having these giant nested pyramids of callbacks, which is a huge pain because every callback you have to handle errors, you have to do all sorts of other work. What promises do is they let you flatten that pyramid and have a chain of, of functions that get called. So in this case, I have a function get data that calls fetch. And then when fetch is done, fetch returns a promise. Promises have two methods, then and catch. Then says, when this finishes, then pass the result into this function, which returns a promise. Then, when foo finishes, pass the result of that into bar. And if there's an error in any of these three functions, in fetch, foo, or bar, that error gets passed into the handle function. So it lets you do all of your error handling in one place at the very end, which is super, super convenient, results in much neater code. And it lets you do things like, all right, so I'm going to try to get data, and then I want to take this processed data and do whatever. But this callback doesn't get run until everything above it, all the rest of the chain, is finished. You will see this a lot because promises are being baked very, very deeply into all these new web platform features. So fetch is a promise-ified version of XHR. So if you're doing like AJAX requests, and you're used to XML HTTP requests, fetch is a replacement for that that's much more ergonomic, but it's based on promises instead of callbacks. Service workers, push, permission APIs, all of those are also being built on promises. And there's an upcoming extension to the syntax of JavaScript, async await, that make it even easier to write asynchronous code, but all of those are, are syntactic sugar on top of promises. So you still behave the same way, you still have to understand how promises work to take advantage of some of these new features. The, the thing to keep in mind for promises is they're basically a very simple state machine. Promises can be in one of three states. They can be pending, or they can be fulfilled, or they can be rejected. And a promise will only ever transition once. It can go from pending to fulfilled, pending to rejected, and that's it. It will never go backwards. It will never change from fulfilled to rejected. And what this says is like, all right, if I go and try to make a network request, I say like, fetch data, then do whatever. So that promise will start out pending. And then when the data is available, the promise will become fulfilled and it will call all of the dot then callbacks that have been registered on. It's promises, you will need to understand them because we're going to use the living daylights out of them in service workers. So what are service workers? <laughs> service workers are the second key technology that lets us solve offline and push notifications. Service workers really simply are JavaScript programs that have superpowers. So a service worker can run, a, a single service worker can be shared between multiple tabs. A service worker can run in the background without any tabs open. Service workers can handle push. Service workers can be programmed to act as a proxy between your website and the broader internet. And this is what's going to let us solve the other two problems with the mobile web. Service workers are pretty straightforward to use. You check for support by checking if the service worker property exists inside the navigator object in your front end. If so, then you call navigator service worker register and pass it a path to a script. Service workers are scoped. So in this case, I'm saying this scope is the root of the, the domain. So this service worker can control, can interact with, can intercept requests on any page of my site. I can restrict it to another domain, or another uh, subpath on my domain. Uh, and by default, if I let this off, it has control over things where it is and below. So if I didn't have this scope argument, this service worker would be able to intercept any calls, any network requests to things in the JS folder and below, but not things in other folders. So you register the service worker. Because service workers are so powerful, you have to do this all over SSL. Your site, the service worker, both have to be served over HTTPS. In the past, this has been a, a big technical and financial hurdle. You have to go pay like Komodo, $800 a month for, for their you know, gold, platinum, whatever certificate. Not anymore. Let's encrypt. Does anyone use Let's Encrypt in the room? Yeah, let's have the room. And some people in that corner. Yeah. So Let's Encrypt is a free certificate authority that Mozilla, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Akamai, Facebook, all of these companies have come together and said it's too important for financial barriers to keep people from, from securing content on the internet. 
So if you need an SSL certificate, Let's Encrypt will issue certificates for free, automatically, and with no restrictions on their use. You can use this for your business, use it for your personal sites. And more and more of these powerful features of the web are going to require encryption. So you'll need to go get a certificate from a provider like Let's Encrypt. So background, done. How do we get offline support on the web? That's where apps win. Apps, by their nature, are offline first, online second. The web, by its nature, is online first, offline second. So we have to find a way to bridge that gap in a way that feels natural to the web. Inside a service worker, we have an API that lets you programmatically build and manipulate caches. Every cache is named. So you have three APIs that you really need to know about. Caches.open, delete, and match. So open opens a cache. It returns a promise that will resolve to that cache. And you can then manipulate the cache, put things into it, pull things out of it. Second is delete, which will completely kill a cache. It resolves to a promise that is a Boolean that says, like, yes, the deletion was successful, or no, the deletion failed. And then match, which takes a request. So I can say caches.match slash faveicon.ico. And if that icon is in my cache, then this resolves to a response containing that data. Does that make sense? OK. So once you have a cache, five key APIs, add, add all, put, delete, match. Add and add all will take a request or an array of requests and let you fetch them from the network and save that response into the cache. So the only things that ever go into the cache are things you put there. You have complete programmatic control. Put is something that's, that's a little different. Put takes a request and a response. And so you can say, instead of saying, like, go out to the network and get this and cache it, with put, you can say, I've got a request, I've got a response. Whenever you see this request, give me this response. So you could generate things programmatically and, like, completely client side, fake out, like, build these things for the cache without ever hitting the network if you needed to. Delete removes things from the cache, match looks things up from the cache. So match, you get a response back. So the way you might use this is you might want to preload. On the first time you hit a website, you might install a service worker. And then inside that service worker, say, all right, add event listener for install. Install fires when the service worker gets added to the page. And I've got an array of content that's not going to change. My, my main JavaScript, my icons, my home page. And so I'll go ahead and open my cache. And then cache add all static content. So I pass it this array. And what this will do is it will then send off five requests in parallel for each of these resources. And when it gets them back, it puts them in the cache. Second thing is, all right, how do I respond from the cache? The service worker acts like a proxy between your website and the internet. The website has no idea that the service worker is, is intercepting its request, it's modifying its request. The website's just trying to say, go get me app.js. When that happens, the service worker receives a fetch event. And instead of just responding naively and saying, all right, go out to the, the network and get this, what we can do instead is say, actually respond with and try to match in our cache the path that we were trying to look up. So you say, all right, match this event request. And then if I got a response, return the response. If I didn't get a response, if that document was not in my cache, then go and fetch it from the network and return that. So what this will do is it basically lets you hit the cache first, if the thing isn't there, then you hit the network. Does that make sense to people? Nice. Yes. 20 lines of code, and all of a sudden you have things like the Pokédex, which is an index of Pokémons, which if I go into airplane mode, open that up, normal web page, but if I try to refresh, it works. It all reloads, despite the phone being completely disconnected to, from the network, because all that data was preloaded by the service worker. You can see how that works right here. So we've got this array of static content. This is the actual code from pokedex.org. So they have all the JavaScript, manifest, icons. And then down at the bottom, here, we'll see, where's add all? All right, so you say, all right. Cache add all static content. So you pass those paths in there, add all those things to the, to the cache. And at the bottom, they have that same exact event listener. 
Whatever this fetch that comes in, try to respond from the cache, and if that fails, go to the network. But because everything the site needs is in the cache, everything will work. So if I come over here, I can again turn my network off and reload the page, and it reloads, and everything works. I can close the tab, I can open the tab, just like I'm online, but I'm not. And all it took was that, that one little line. The web page itself didn't have to change at all. It had to install the service worker. But it's otherwise just sending completely normal network requests. And instead of those coming from the web, they're being responded to by the service worker. They've got normal response headers. They've got normal response bodies. Super great. Because what this means is this means you can add offline capability progressively. You can set this up in your app right now. And if you're visiting that page with Firefox or Chrome, you have offline support. If you're visiting it in Safari or Internet Explorer, well, you don't have offline support, but nothing breaks because it just doesn't know that there's a service worker there. It doesn't know how to run a service worker to respond to those requests. Let's turn that back on. All right, does that make sense? Programmatic cache. So the cool thing is it's not just limited to to offline support. You can do all sorts of amazing things with service workers because it gives you complete programmatic control. You have a request come in, you can catch it, you can modify it, you can generate your own response. And we have this cookbook at service workers, like serviceworke.rs, that has all these examples, one of which I find particularly interesting is a virtual server where the service worker code for this basically has this list of, of quotations. And when you try to hit API quotations, the worker intercepts that request and just responds with the data it has locally. Or if you try to put, you know, send a delete or a post HTTP verb, it also intercepts those. So if I come over here and I say, all right, add foo bar, you see I did a post, but the service worker responded instead of this actually going out to the network, despite this being targeted as post to you know, API quotations on my server. It's intercepted, handled by the browser. You can do crazy stuff, and you can mock up entire backend APIs completely client side using a service worker. So that's offline. Offline's surprisingly straightforward. What about engagement? What about things like push messages? Push is one of the few things that I think is undervalued on the web. As far as I can tell, the majority of my interactions with my phone are driven by push notifications. You know, I get an email, I get an SMS, I have a download, a Facebook message. I pull out my phone and I look and it's just there. I don't have those sites open. The notification is there, I touch on the notification, it takes me to the right place, I can interact, I can respond, it works. This is hugely valuable. So there's an example notification on Android. Here's an example web notification. They don't exist. This is terrible. If my main way of getting to apps, being reminded of things and getting into things deeply is through a notification, if the web can't give notifications, it's not useful. Now it can. So Facebook has actually been using web notifications for people on Chrome, and they look absolutely identical to a native notification. You see a little Chrome icon there, but otherwise you have an image, you have text, you have a title, you have a URL, if I were to tap on any of those notifications, it would take me deeply into the right place on the Facebook website. So the web can do this now. Uh, Firefox just gained this ability three weeks ago on desktop. We should be rolling out on Android in just a few more weeks, or a few more releases. And it's pretty straightforward. So the way you, you push is you have to get permission from the user, because this can be really annoying, right? Like if sites, when you weren't looking at them, could show you notifications on your, your home screen. So again, we're using service workers. And what we're going to do with the service workers is we're going to say navigator, service worker, ready. Ready is a promise that resolves to the active service worker. So this is kind of how I get a reference to the service worker on the page. Then once I have that reference to the service worker called a registration, I can call on the registration's push manager property, I can call subscribe, which says like set me up to receive push messages. Now, because this is a, an API that could be abused, we're going to give you a prompt that says, hey, this site wants to give you notifications. Do you want to allow that or not? 
And you have to, as a user, explicitly grant permission and say, yes, I'm okay getting push notifications from this site. But as soon as you click allow on that page, the rest of this promise chain will run. So we'll get a subscription object back, and inside that object is everything you need to know to send a push notification to that browser. And it's actually really straightforward. It's just an HTTP endpoint. Like, you post to it, and a push notification happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that I'm going to use the fetch function to post that subscription as JSON to a backend on my server. So someone said, I want to subscribe to push notifications. I have a reference. I'm like, all right, well, if I want to give you a push notification, I have to have this data. So I'll send it to my backend, shove it in a database. I can use it in the future. So how do I, so I've got this, this way to interact with people. Let's actually, let's take a look at this real quick. So what this might look like is, here's a serialized push endpoint. Got this property endpoint that has this enormous URL on it. If I copy that, all it takes to actually send a push is curl. So I can say curl x post header ttl zero. So if, if the user is not currently online, the ttl zero says only only send this push if the user is currently online. If they're not, don't. Then use that URL. Turn. If the network works, what we should see. Don't is a notification. Oh, come on. Well, let's try another example. Service workers. Well, it makes me the network's really slow. Very simple. Demo. All right, so double check. Allow notifications. What you do? Do that. Close the tab. Network. <laughs> All right, so I swear this works on the network at the Ramada. I'll have to debug that later. Anyways, all it takes is, is a push. As long as the user is online and ports aren't blocked, it's a WebSocket connection. The service worker gets a notification that says, hey, you have a push. And then it's up to the service worker. So the service worker can run even if none of the tabs are open. So like, if Gmail was doing this, you could close your Gmail tab, reclaim all of that RAM. And then if a push came in from Gmail, Gmail's service worker would wake up, and this event listener would run. And so what this gets is it gets an event. You can say, all right, well, I'm going to go do some stuff, so don't go away until I'm done with this promise. I'm going to do a self-registration show notification. I can give that a title. I can give it a body. I can give it an icon. I can connect actions to it. So you can actually see the history of like the previous ones that I was testing. And they show up in the normal system, system tray, and like when I click, they can take me to the page that spawned the notification. They'll reopen the tab even if it's not previously open. And they show up just like native, native notifications. So on OS 10 they look like that. They look normal on Linux, they look normal on Windows. And you saw in the screenshot from Android, they can look completely indistinguishable from native notifications. The, the support here is still kind of shaky. So Chrome can do this, but their, the way you interact with their server isn't a simple post. You have to like register with Google before you can push to Chrome users, which is weird. But they swear they're fixing that. So that's kind of the, the broad overview. The web can be just as installable, reliable, or as engaging as a native app. And it can do so progressively. You can implement all of these things right now. And if the browser you're using doesn't support them, no problem. The web just keeps working like it always has worked. But once that user's browser supports things like Service Worker or Push or App Manifest, your users transparently and automatically start getting a better experience. So this is the sort of thing that lets you say to a client that says, oh, well, you, know, you can make a great mobile website, but you know, what about offline? You say, well, you know, we can use a Service Worker. And it'll work offline for X percent of the web right now and the rest of the web in a year. And maybe it's worth just building that one code base instead of going through the rigmarole of having you know, your mobile web experience and your Android experience and your iPhone experience. Because the web is able to do this now. It's just not evenly distributed yet. So I want to leave a lot of time for demos and questions. Um, the most important thing 
this service worker's cookbook at serviceworke.rs is absolutely phenomenal. It shows you all the things you can do in terms of using a service worker to relay messages between tabs of your site, pushing with uh, notification payloads, and everything has annotated source, so you can go in and see, you know, all right, what does what and why. Let's, I'm gonna try one more time, see if I can get a push to work normally. Push push notifications, see, delay three. Okay, so it's making it to my back end fine. Air connection refused. Okay, so something with the network here isn't letting me actually get out to the, the push server, but I suspect that other notifications would have trouble too. Anyway, so I want to go to questions and like do some live coding and poke at this stuff in response to what you want to know. These are the fundamental technologies. Don't forget to rate the session and fit me link there. What questions do you have about this? What about mobile Safari? Mobile Safari? Um, let's see. I don't have my autocomplete for some. There we go. So platform status, Mozilla.org tracks a lot of stuff. So push. No signals from Safari or Opera right now, which is unfortunate. Service worker, considering, not there yet. Basically, these things have, have landed in the production, the release versions of Firefox and Chrome and Opera. Um, Apple is excited about it, but Apple moves a lot more slowly for JavaScript APIs, which is unfortunate. How about uh, pages that are content heavy? Are they able to cache everything, or do you have to pick Sure, I mean, you, get, you have similar limits to what you have with IndexedDB, where uh, you get several megabytes to use for free, otherwise you might have to prompt the user for more, more space, but, but generally, just shove stuff into the cache. It should work in all but like the very largest of sites. Um, it's the sort of thing that, especially if you're using headless Drupal and you're doing, you're really just sending your data and then doing all the templating and running on the front end, that's a great use for this because you're you're just caching what you need to reconstitute the front end view. All these, all these applications look for the availability and the sketching mechanism. For the which mechanism? The sketching mechanism. What we are using the demo. So sorry, I couldn't. <coughs> oh, the caching mechanism. How you have used here, right? Yeah. So so what I've been doing is. Um, if that was a question, could you repeat it? How, how no. this uh, this type of application will work with the real time data? No, he, he, he oh, so yeah. Yes, yeah. Right. So how will this work with like real time data? So you have complete control over the cache. You can do whatever you need. You can bring things in, cache it, and then say, all right, well, also make a network request and get the things from the cache and make sure that nothing is outdated. It doesn't necessarily like you have to do your own web sockets if you want to have like actual events getting pushed into the browser. Uh, push notifications aren't necessarily for anything other than I want to show something to the user. Um, but you can play, service workers play really nicely with WebSockets for, all right, let me let me cache like this bulk batch data and then just stream the updates. You can put those into the cache too. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, we have been using app cache. I mean, it's not a great technology, but we have been using app cache for caching and it's been way really okay. And what are your thoughts about app cache? So the difficulty with app cache is that, which is a, a previous technology that has pretty wide support for doing offline. Um, app cache is a, is a solution that if you are using, if you're trying to do offline exactly the way that app cache wants you to do offline, it works pretty well. But it's very opinionated about how offline should work. So if you wanted to do something more esoteric, or you have one place where what you're doing was different than what app cache expected, everything falls apart. Like the, uh, there's a wonderful talk from the full frontal conference in 2013 where some Gmail engineers said, you know, we had this problem, we were using app cache and we were seeing this huge memory growth when we left Gmail, but we couldn't figure out what was going wrong. And it turns out that the Gmail engineers had misunderstood some of the, the nuances of how app cache worked. And so we're just caching every single version of the entire Gmail app 
every time they refresh from the app, that's like, app cache is just hard to use right. So the idea with service workers is it's a very simple API. Like You have to explicitly say, put this in the cache, take this out of the cache. Um, and we've, we've seen a lot more success with that. And it's also more flexible. And for now, when there's no other solution, right? So you have to use app cache if you can't rely on like latest Firefox, latest uh, Chrome. The we are actively working to take app cache out of Firefox. So, and that's, that's, there's similar signals from other manufacturers. So if you're using app cache now, like now is the time to start moving to service workers, because that's, we decide app cache is a dead end, kind of collectively as browser vendors. So you know the problem with um, app cache, something's announced. Right. And so we'll go away until service workers are more broadly supported, but service workers are the next answer. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So what are the, the limitations, like if you were, Thinking of like a generic Drupal module that say like loaded every URL and stuck it in a cache or what, would it would it I mean is it all in memory is it gonna you know, like you put the whole entire site into so problems are resource utilization right I mean your these requests get fired in parallel so you may completely kill your users bandwidth unless you have some nice throttling like it initially installs um, just using space on disk but you can zip things you can put whatever you need in the cache in whatever format you need. Disadvantage is just, is it worth it? Are you, should you load everything? If, you're, if you have a very big site, it may be better to load things as the user navigates around and keep, say, the last 15 or 20 pages that they visited in the cache. And you can, you can implement, it's all you know, programmatically controlled and say, all right, I'm gonna put something else in, evict this other thing. And you can manage that as you need to. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I don't, not as a, as a non Drupal developer, I can't specifically answer your question as to like, what would a module look like? But I suspect it would be possible and wonderful. Um, you know how they say they're too hard problems with computer science, mm -hmm. naming things in cache and validation. Um, are there any mechanisms that address the second with uh, with service workers? Because it just seems like it shuts off all the cache, like managing the cache work to the service worker. Right. It it basically does. the The way you handle the cache and validation is like you have to you have to deal with that yourself, and you have to hope that either you get it right or that somebody else has written a nice library for it. The nice thing about the, the responses you get back from the service room, where you say like, all right, match this request and show me a, a response that I could use. That response is a full response object as defined by the fetch standard. So you can look at like headers, like should this have expired by now, whatever. And you can be responsive to like the normal caching mechanisms that HTTP uses. So cache control headers and whatever. Um, you just have to be mindful to, to do that. The other thing is that service workers get reinstalled at least every 24 hours. So if you have like a bum service worker that like you wrote it wrong, it's totally terrible, you can put a new version up and your users will be using that new version within 24 hours. Like that's part of this. You can have something that listens on initialization to say, okay, on the install event, what I want to do is I want to look at all of my caches that exist and like you can add a version name in your cache name and say, all right, well, copy these things out of that old cache into this new cache, drop the old cache, you know, re-instantiate things, whatever. So you can just kind of like, multi-tier thing. It's really roll your own, but uh, it turns out to not be that bad in practice. Just to answer my own question, there, was, um, there already is a module for Drupal, but it's not really um, finished yet. But yeah, if anyone's interested. Yeah. Why? So, so I'm, not, I'm not a Drupal person, like other than I, I used Drupal 3 back in the day for a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I went to WordPress, and then I went to Python. So like I, I've been way out of the woods in this. Uh, but it's the sort of thing that I, I would love to, if anyone here has the expertise and wants to start working on that module and improving it, I can answer the, the questions about the service worker side, and you can answer the Drupal side, but you can build something really beautiful. Yeah, do users have any control on the cache, and they drop the cache? So not, not directly. I mean, through the, the browser dev tools, the user could go in and you know, start a debugging session inside the service worker and clear the cache. You install in the, uh, as, a native, as an application, uh, you don't have the browser uh, menu. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. You don't have the browser menu when you install it on the application. Sorry, can, can you, like, the very install first part of the sentence. <laughs> it's an installable application. You're right. using the manifest. Yeah. So you install it. After that, we don't have the browser menu. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So how do I can control the cache? So at that point, I mean. Another place where you might want to repeat the question. Right. So, so this is 
the question is, if I, if I do what we saw in the Flipkart video, where I don't have the browser menu anymore, so how can I control this? Kind of an open question. You could connect the DevTools to your phone. It should be exposed. In like the Chrome or the Firefox DevTools, you should be able to see the installed apps there and access them. Um, otherwise, things that are cached, I believe it's a separate container from the web. So if you remove this from your phone, if you like click and drag to uninstall, that cache should get deleted at that point. Um, so when you uninstall this application, the cache will get deleted? It should. I'm not certain on that. Um, why do you, it leads to a lot of uh, confusion in the users also. As uh, he was pointing it out, when new versions come, no? they will not be able to get the new version. So they will say that I am not getting this option in that old, the uh, old uh, application they may be having. So right. when you deploy a new version, the cache is not getting updated. So you don't get the new JavaScript. And user has to drop the application once again. You have to <coughs> impact that. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so see, from that point of view, also, can I take out a JavaScript, put a new JavaScript? Over? So that question, what like, is how do you avoid this? becoming stale. And what you do is, like again, this, this obeys the same rules when the service worker gets reinstalled every, like refetched and reinstalled every 24 hours. And so you can, and like when you launch the app, you can get a signal from the service worker. And you can then, from inside the service worker, make a call out to the network to see, is my information still current? And if it's not, then you can say, all right, well, drop this cache, go pull these other things down, put them into a new cache. It's something you still have to handle manually, because offline is, is hard, but it is possible to do, and it's possible to say, all right, I, I need updated resources, go get them. Yeah, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is that, uh, can we access uh, local resources on the service worker, like can, uh, on a daily basis? So, so the question is, what resources does the service worker have access to? The service worker has a similar container to a web worker, where it's, it has no access to the DOM. It runs in its own thread. You can't modify elements on page. You can do things like index db, off screen canvas. You can you can do a lot of data crunching and manipulation, but you can't directly affect the broader page. You have to do that through a messaging channel. Um, do you have to have the app installed in order to use the cache, right? You can while you're developing the app you can always work in browser connections. Right, right. So the installation is really just a cosmetic improvement. It works the same way you can develop the same way by just developing a browser. You don't have to install it to get anything other than like, I want to hide the browser UI. Like that's, that's the real thing that installation gives you is the, the pretty icon and the invisible browser UI. Okay. Hi. Um, so I, I'm sure you covered this in parts of your talk, but uh, can you clarify, so do you install a service worker or is it something that gets installed? Is it related to the manifest file you showed earlier? So service workers are something that you you have to <coughs> directly install. Well, I guess I did it right at the beginning. There we go. So in your front end code, you have to actually call navigator.serviceworker.register and pass it the path to the JavaScript file that you want your service worker to be. Um, you can have multiple service workers. The only rule is that the service workers can't have overlapping scopes. So because this worker has a root scope, I couldn't have any other workers on this page. But if I, or, or on this domain, but if I wanted to have a worker for you know, this section of my site and a worker for that section of my site, it would be possible to stand up multiple workers. Hello. So um, if, if I clear the browser cache, then the service worker still works? So if you clear the browser cache, does the service worker still work? The service worker will still work, I believe, Actually, I don't know. I would expect it's cached to also. Oh, but that would, that would. All right, so I'm trying to reason from like first principles. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, let's find out. So I'm just going to turn this off. And. This is the part where I actually don't know where to clear the cache in Firefox, which is super awkward. <laughs> it's like, don't do that, right? Like, I just launch a new profile. <laughs> Whatever, we can, we can look at this later. I'm, I'm curious about this. 
Um, but yeah, I would, I would expect the service worker cache not to be affected in the same way that if you could layer the cache, you wouldn't expect things like index DB to go away. But, huh? That's a really good question. Right, index DB does stay, correct? Yeah. Oh, the current version? We, huh. That's, I don't clear caches, which is something I should. <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah, so maybe maybe we would also clear this. Right, which in that case, I mean, the service worker should still exist. They would just start having cache misses, and you'd want to have a strategy to deal with that. That's that's super curious. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna fix this talk and figure that out for the next time. Huh? Thank you. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, I had a question regarding the incognito tab. So how does that uh, work there? Like, will it be able to store? Because incognito would be like a private window. Sometimes there it varies from browser to browser. Um, I believe. I believe Firefox will not let you set up a service worker in a... Chrome does have incognito. Right. And Firefox as well. Right, but I think it... Uh, let's see. Yeah, so in, a, in our private window, service worker is not defined. So we don't let you install service worker in a private window. I think Chrome does, and then just nukes the whole thing when you're done. So that's something that we should probably improve for the developer experience. Right. But it's, it's something you can't necessarily rely on. But again, that's the nice thing about service workers is it's your page doesn't have any logic that ties directly to the worker, generally. So it'll just work normally without the offline support. Thank you. Can you give an example where the service worker would be responding to Sure, that was, uh, so where would the service worker respond to HTTP post requests? Yeah, uh, my actual question is why so why, why would it? So you might want to do something like, if you can, if you know what the response will be from a post, mm -hmm. you could intercept it, do all the logic in the service worker, and then respond much more quickly before actually doing the, the entire round trip to the network backend. Okay. And you can kind of use that as a, as a fast response and say, all right, when you did the post, this is the change. And in parallel, still let that request go through. And if you get back something that looks different than you expected, then you can update it. But you can make the site look a lot more responsive that way, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Hello. Uh, actually, I have a question. So I can you raise your hand? I'm, it's hard because like, everyone's microphone yeah. comes from the same. Uh, actually, any <laughs> recommendation for uh, cache disk capability something? Can we for cache? Browser cache disk capability, capacity actually. Any uh, preferred limit for that or server service workers that get on its own? Sorry, can you, can you? I'm saying browser cache disk capacity. So the browser cache, like listing the capacity of it? Or? Yeah, for, of the browser. I mean, when, when, right. when I install a browser, it by default sets some 8 MB or something. Mm -hmm. Or maybe some 30, 35 or KB. How much so, data he can, it can be stored? How, how can it, oh yeah, so. Is there any limit? Give a one GB JavaScript and you can take up the test space, something like that. Right. How much you can test? So I, I don't know the actual limits, that's something that is worth. For earlier, we have 5 GB, 5 GB, or app cache or You can extend it if you want. Right. But the user's uh, answer is to buy for that. The earlier version. So yeah, so I, I don't know what the actual limits are right now or how, how to extend it. Um, I can look into that. One question is actually outside of uh, this one. Sure. But now I think Mozilla is uh, Firefox is blocking this uh, NP API. Right. right. So what is the So the question is, Firefox is dropping plugin support, the yeah. NP API. What's the alternative for that? Um, the web as a whole is moving away from from binary plugins. One of the, the main things that's replacing that is JavaScript. Right? Implement your decoder, implement whatever in JavaScript. 
Um, you don't have the, cap the raw capabilities that a NVIDIA API plugin would have, but you can get the same speed. So we have a, I don't know if you looked at Asm.js, which is now turning into WebAssembly, but all the browser vendors are working on a, a byte code for the web that can perform to within 10% of C's <laughs> performance. It has you know, kind of worker-esque permissions, so you can run your own thread, you can run multiple threads. It gives you a lot of things that you might otherwise need a, a plugin for. So we can use that to like implement, you can actually implement Flash in JavaScript and render it in Canvas performantly. And then you don't need a plugin for Flash anymore. Um, there are people who have written video codecs that do the same thing. So plugins are going away, There's, the replacement is use JavaScript, basically. How do you access local resources? Because we use the digital signature kind of thing. Right. How do you do How do you do signatures and access local resources? You used to do a plugin. It's an open question. It hasn't been, there's no, no good answer to that right now. Anyways, I think we are at time or a little over. So again, please go read the session. Please talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to look at things and explore them. Thank you all so much. Thank you.